Hey, everybody. <laughs> I put out a video. Was it a video? I guess it was a podcast. That is, you know, all my podcasts get uh, ported over here to YouTube. So here's a comment uh, based on this, this podcast. On the topic of the cultural struggle over COVID, Duncan writes, I'm with you and finding the whole thing tiresome. I've seen Facebook friends go full retard on the anti-vax COVID malarkey, and I've seen folks go the other way, never leaving their home without a medical mask and obsessive boosters. Many of my Facebook friends from the peak oil days have veered off into all manner of conspiracy theory rabbit holes. Vaccinations, q adjacent stuff, carnivorous diets, seed oil is trying to kill you, a whole lot of pro-Russia slash pro-China anti-US sentiment, too. It's like they're desperately trying to find something to replace their obsession with peak oil doom, and in the process, going slightly nuts. So what Duncan is talking about there is the fact that for a very long time, when I started the Sea Realm podcast back in 2006, I was interested in the psychedelic sort of renaissance. I was interested in... Um, nanotechnology and artificial intelligence and uh you know i was i was a techno utopian uh psychedelic kind of you know happy free spirit and then kind of got crushed uh economically which you know put me into a grumpy conspiratorial mood and i gravitated to this whole peak oil thing and i spent a long time you know in that headspace and that whole time i was podcasting so i attracted an audience of people who had the same interests and at the time, you know, I just saw it as, hey, look, this here's a fundamental flaw in the whole project of this industrial civilization. It, it doesn't have long to live. And if you believe that, then you also have to believe that the governments, you know, they have access to the same information you do and more. And uh, so if they're not talking about it, it must be because they're covering it up. They don't want you to know. They have some plan to preserve their authority through this population bottleneck, uh, but you know they just have to manage the population and make sure that everybody is, you know, just kept quiet and pacified and distracted long enough so that the government can make their plans. And it's very, you know, it, it leads to a, a conspiratorial mindset. So you know there are people who are, you know, they're really into the geology. They're really into the. Um, the physics, they're really into the math of it all. And, you know, they, they got a pretty scientific mindset and they're not spreading doom. You know, they, they look at the, the numbers and they say, yeah, I mean, this can't go on forever, but it's also really, really hard to project, you know, an exact date or predict an exact date when a, a system which can't go on forever will eventually break down. People who come up with exact dates are prophets. They're not scientists. You know, they, they have a, a prophecy of doom that they're pimping to the people who are receptive to it. And there were a lot of people who are receptive, receptive to it. And, you know, I've done videos in the past where I, I ask, was peak oil a conspiracy theory? And, you know, people respond and say, absolutely not. You know, and then they, they give me their hard science mathematical story about peak oil. It's like, yeah, but where have the people who are into it gone since then because as i've pointed out in in conversations on podcasts and other such places the peak oil community as i knew it couldn't exist today because it was a big tent under which dissidents from both the right and the left had gathered you had survivalist types you know people who really fetishized their guns and their preparedness you know and their their larders their meals ready to eat their panic rooms and all that good stuff and then you had the, the back to the land hippie folks who were really looking forward to the end of industrial civilization. So we could get back to, you know, a life closer to the earth with honest toil and closeness to animals and getting your, your hands in the dirt and all that good stuff. And after the Trump years, you know, those two factions have been driven to very far extremes to where they hate each other. You know, so there are people in the peak oil, you know, from the peak oil um, what, what do I want to call them? I mean, the sorts of people that I interviewed <laughs> during that period, you know, during the, uh, the aughts and the 20 teens, 
um, you know, people who used to regularly appear together at events, uh, who might be on the same podcast, you know, they might be on the same episode of the same podcast. Uh, they don't talk to each other anymore, you know, because they've gone in such weird directions uh, since, you know, the peak oil thing, the peak oil uh, center of gravity just dissipated. And all these these orbits just sort of, you know, they, they just meandered off into weird directions and they're not close to each other anymore. So I'm, I'm in a position now where, like for the longest time, not the longest time, but a few years, you know, when I decided that, no, I'm, I'm not hanging with this peak oil, fast collapse, doom stuff anymore. I didn't really know what I was into. And I was kind of just grumpy, <laughs> you know? And now, um, you know, I, I studied philosophy of mind in grad school in the 90s. It, it was a, you know, a decades-long obsession for me, but it was an obsession in the abstract because on the surface, nothing was happening. You know, stuff was happening in university labs and, and things like that, but it wasn't amounting to much. And now that's, it's really the, um, you know, the large language models that people can interact with, you know, non-technical people can just have conversations with them that I think is generating all this excitement. You can take anybody, anybody at all, and set them down, you know, with Pi or with GPT, you know, chat GPT-4 or, you know, whatever, um, particularly if it's a voice interface. And just, you know, get them chatting, and then it's clear something has happened. Like, machines couldn't do that a couple of years ago. Yeah, you had chat features, but, you know, they were clunky. You could tell they weren't a person. Uh, so now that there's so much attention on artificial intelligence, and there's so much new investment, there's so many, you know, businesses, and there's an arms race between the U.S. and China and various other, you know, geopolitical powers, and there's corporate arms races. I mean, there's just so much money and talent and attention going into the field now that, progress is dramatic. It's rapid. And it's like, I've been waiting for this for decades. It's like now, I don't know, I, I'm, I'm having trouble, like putting myself back into the peak oil conspiracy mindset and wondering or playing out how would the KMO of like 2014 have reacted if the AI situation of 2023 was the reality back then? I imagine it would have snapped me out of it pretty quick. Because this is something that I'm much better prepared to engage with, you know, is this sudden gush of progress in AI. And I'm very pleased with it. I mean, I, I spin out doomsday scenarios um, with Pi, you know, that's personal intelligence. It's a chatbot from Inflection AI. And I talk to it all the time about the dark side, you know, of, of the rise of AI. But when I'm talking to y'all, well, you know, when I'm talking on a podcast, when I'm speaking in public or I'm writing a blog post, I just, I don't allow myself to dwell at all on dark scenarios because I'm absolutely not interested in swapping out peak oil doom for AI doom. Even if, even if Eliezer Yudkowsky is 100% right and we are all just living on borrowed time, the AI is going to eat our lunch sometime darn soon and there's nothing we can do about it. If that's the case... I don't care. <laughs> I mean, uh, it's you know, when I say I don't care, I mean obviously that's not the the future that I prefer, but I'm not going to obsess over it. You know, um, I'm I'm going to consider the possibilities for this being a good thing, while at the same time acknowledging that yeah, it's fraught with a lot of potential for. <laughs> I'd say unintended consequences. They, they surely will be unintended consequences, but not unforeseen consequences. I mean, everybody's, everybody's got their pet doomsday theory. Uh, the funny thing is that nobody's right, you know, um, not in all the details. So every, every doomer, <laughs> if they live long enough to see what happens, will be surprised by the exact way that doom plays out, if it does. But it might not. Let's all just live in that moment, you know, just in that, that realization for a second that things might actually turn out okay. <laughs> Is that offensive to you? That's offensive to a lot of people. There are a lot of people who, if you say anything positive about, you know, the potential for some future development, they accuse you of being a hopium addict. Wow. Is this the face of a hopium addict? <laughs> if so, what do you get?
what do you get for making that, uh, you know, putting that label on me? Anyway, that is all. Talk to you soon.